Hello, everyone, uh, and welcome to the webinar, Marine Biodiversity Beyond National Jurisdiction in the Southeast Pacific and Southeast Atlantic. Um, I hope you can all hear us okay. We have a, an hour planned for a webinar. Uh, this webinar is co-hosted by the Abidjan Convention Secretariat, along with the Secretariat of the Permanent Commission of the South Pacific and the Strong High Seas Project. Uh, the webinar is part of a series of events planned by the project with its co-hosts and part of the BBNJ negotiations. Other events include a capacity building workshop on the 3rd of September and an expert workshop meeting on the 8th of September, also as part of the BBNJ negotiations and in New York. So please get a hold of us if you have uh, interest in attending these events or are going to be in New York. Um, before we get started, we just wanted to take a few minutes and tell you a little bit about the Strong High Seas Project. Uh, this is a five-year project. It started in June 2017 and goes until May 2022. It's funded by the German Federal Ministry for the Environment, Nature, Conservation, and Nuclear Safety through the International Climate Initiative, so the, the ICCI Initiative. It's coordinated by the Institute for Advanced Sustainability Studies uh, and has implementing partners, uh, Sustainable Institute for Sustainable Development and International Relations in Paris, France, the International Ocean Institute of South Africa, uh, the Universidad Católica del Norte, UCN, and WWF Germany, uh, as well as some of the partners that we have here presenting today, which is BirdLife International Africa and WWF Colombia. We also have the regional partners who are co-hosts here today is the Abidjan Convention Secretariat and the Permanent Commission for the South Pacific. So the objective of the Strong High Seas Project is to develop and support new approaches for ocean governance towards approved conservation and sustainable management of marine biodiversity in areas beyond national jurisdiction. The project works in three primary ways. So this is first, it works within two specific regions, being the Southeast Pacific, uh, so the west coast of South America, and the Southeast Atlantic, of the west coast of Africa. Um, and here it tries to engage with local stakeholders, governments, private sector, scientists, and civil society to support integrated management approaches for the conservation and sustainable use of biodiversity and then facilitate the delivery of these proposed approaches into relevant regional policy processes. The second uh, primary way the project works uh, is it focuses on inter-regional exchange um, between different marine regions regarding best practices and lessons learned for ocean governance in an effort to support the sharing of knowledge and information. And finally, the project explores links and opportunities for regional governance uh, in a new internationally and legally binding instrument on marine biodiversity in the high seas, which is currently underway in negotiations uh, in New York next month. So today we have a, a great webinar planned for you over the next hour. Um, first, we're going to hear from Professor Pat Halpin, along with Professor Daniel Dunn and Guillermo Crespo, uh, a PhD candidate all uh, of Duke University's Marine Geospatial Ecology Lab uh, about the latest science uh, on the importance of global marine biodiversity in areas beyond national jurisdiction. After the presentation, we're going to have a first Q&A session uh, for about 10 minutes. And after that, we will have two more presentations where Dr. Ross Wanless from BirdLife International and Johanna Prus Prusman from WWF Columbia will provide specific examples of marine biodiversity and challenges faced in areas beyond national jurisdiction in the Southeast Pacific and Southeast Atlantic. This then we will have another Q&A session following these two presentations. So please write your questions into the box on the side if you have one and you can write them in during the presentations as well and we will get to the questions during the Q&A session. So all microphones of participants have been muted, uh, so you're aware. And also we will be recording the webinar and posting it online afterwards. Um, and as well, you should receive a short five question survey after the webinar. So please take a few moments and fill this out uh, as this would help us a lot. Thank you.
Yes, good morning. My name is Pat Halpin. Um, I hope that you can hear me well. Um, I'm from the Marine Geospatial Ecology Lab, and I'm going to be presenting on marine biodiversity beyond national jurisdiction. And also my colleagues, Daniel Dunn and Guillermo Otuno Crespo are here um, from Duke University. So this is a very, very broad topic, and we have just 10 minutes to go through it. So we're going to be fairly superficial, and hopefully we can catch questions at the end if you have particular questions. So to begin with, biodiversity beyond national jurisdiction is really unevenly distributed in the oceans. And this is important because once a one-size-fits-all solution to our governance and management of biodiversity is not going to succeed. And so we need information and detailed information on the biodiversity of the oceans by different ecoregions, by different kinds of taxa, um, and different depths in the oceans. So these are very, very intricate issues and issues that we're making great progress on. Another major issue with biodiversity in the oceans is that the oceans are fluid and dynamic. And so we have species that are moving back and forth across the oceans, moving back and forth across jurisdictions. And so many animals in the oceans travel quite, quite long distances across many different ocean basins. Complicating matters even more is the fact that our jurisdictions in the oceans are um, fairly complex, where we have jurisdictions for national boundaries, we have jurisdictions to the 200 nautical mile limit of the extended um, economic zones of different countries, we have continental shelf, um, extended continental shelf proposals, and so these areas are, um, are quite dispersed in our oceans around the world. 60% of our oceans are beyond national jurisdiction. And this is extremely important as we go into discussing a new BB&J treaty, because this means that only international institutions can deal effectively with these areas. And so this is the focus of our topic today, is how do we provide the data and information needed to look at managing these areas beyond national jurisdiction? So many species migrate long distances through both national and international waters, and we really need to have shared information and international cooperation to be able to effectively manage this biodiversity. There are a number of international efforts to manage biological diversity in areas beyond national jurisdiction. So this rather complicated chart here is showing the many different international activities International Seabed Authority, UNESCO, FAO, UNEP, um, the Duales Law of the Sea Group, all the different parts of United Nations and international activities that deal with various aspects of areas beyond national jurisdiction. The thing that's most important right now this month is preparing for the negotiations to be going on in New York coming up in September the IGC negotiations. So we're very interested in trying to provide information to the parties going into that negotiation on where do we stand right now in our knowledge base on biodiversity beyond national jurisdiction. Our lab group has worked on several different policy briefs um, to help support the BB&J negotiations. Two of them I have on the screen here is a policy brief on adjacency issues and another one on open ocean considerations. Currently, we're putting together another one specifically on biodiversity data for areas beyond national jurisdiction, and we will hopefully have this developed and ready for New York in several weeks. So we just wanted to advertise this that we will have this policy brief um, developed for the New York negotiations. And some of the things I'm gonna be speaking about this morning are gonna be contained in that policy brief. So the first main point I want to make is that we really need open access marine biodiversity data as the necessary starting point to manage biodiversity beyond national jurisdiction. And this is essential. And it's not just having data, it's having data that's openly accessible to all parties and all interested groups and stakeholders to be able to understand and to be able to manage, effectively manage biodiversity in the oceans. 
I currently work and have worked for many years with the Ocean Biogeographic Information System, or OBIS, which was started out as an academic exercise under the Census of Marine Life almost 20 years ago. Um, it is now under IOC and is a formal um, organization in the, as an international body. So OBIS is the main repository for, for international data on marine biodiversity um, and currently has more than 7.5 million records in areas beyond national jurisdiction. This map here is a map of the distribution of marine biodiversity data globally held within OBIS. And as you can see, there's a variety of data there and the hot colors, the red and orange colors are areas where we have a fairly significant amount of data and the areas that are blue or white is where we have fairly limited data. So you can see the distributions are not evenly spread around the oceans. In addition to the geographic distribution, we also need to think about the taxonomic distribution of our information and data. And so this graph here is showing the data holdings within OBIS in areas beyond national jurisdiction. And what you can see is that some of the most well-known species like fish and marine mammals, seabirds, sea turtles, um, fit how they fit into this distribution. But there's a large amount of biodiversity data that deals with microbes and invertebrates that many people don't consider. And this is the area where we will see the largest growth of new data in the future. The distribution of biodiversity data in the oceans also isn't distributed evenly when we think about the vertical structure of the oceans. So we have our highest density of data holdings near the coast. And we also have data holdings at the surface of the ocean. So you can see the red thin area there. But what we're missing data or lacking data or could improve on this data is in the far offshore areas and areas in the midwater column and deep seas. So we need continued data collection in the offshore areas beyond national jurisdiction, in the midwater column, and also in the deep seas. One of the points I want to make is that we need to sustain and strengthen the ocean observing networks that already exist. And two of them, the Global Ocean Observing System, or GOOSE, and another, the Marine Biodiversity Observing Network, or IMBON, are two of the observing networks that feed information and give us guidance on how to collect and normalize information to be used in areas beyond national jurisdiction. OBIS is the main repository of a lot of this information once it's collected. So the point I want to make here is that we need to properly strengthen and support existing international infrastructure. And I really think we should do this instead of developing new or duplicative institutions. We already have the infrastructure, but it's, it needs to be strengthened and supported into the future. And this is something I think should come out in the BB&J negotiations. In addition to the BB&J negotiations, there have been ongoing work with biodiversity in areas beyond national jurisdiction. One significant area has been the efforts under the Convention on Biological Diversity de designating and defining ecologically or biologically significant areas, or EBSIS. Our group has been involved in this process since the origin. EBSAs are a synthesis of available scientific and technical information to support scientific judgment um, and the application of the EBSA criteria. These have been conducted through regional workshops over the last decade. These are regional scientific expert processes and there are seven criteria that can be described for areas that meet these criteria and are, are defined or described as ecologically important. There have been 13 regional workshops to date, and we are currently looking at ways to review and revise existing workshop regions. Um, I just returned two weeks ago from meetings in the African region from Angola for the Benguela Current, where we we're looking at potential revisions um, and updates and improvements to the EBSA um, workshop outcomes. And so this is a, a very interesting time now to be refining and further developing the EBSA process. To date, there are currently 279 EBSAs that have been described globally. There are 319 that are in process. 
Um, so in addition to the 279, the total number is 319. These have gone through Substa, and some remaining EPSAs need to go through the COP meeting coming up in Egypt. Of these, over 10% are entirely in areas beyond national jurisdiction, and 22% have some or all areas in national jurisdiction, beyond national jurisdiction. Um, some of the largest EPSA sites are in the areas beyond national jurisdiction, the large oceanographic areas. Another point that's very important in going into the negotiations is that connectivity across ocean basins is extremely important. Um, this is showing just a diagram of, of shearwater bird migrations in the Pacific, showing individual animals traveling across the entire Pacific Basin from the Southern Hemisphere to the Northern Hemisphere and back. There are three work packages ongoing right now with a project under the Global Ocean Biodiversity Initiative that are looking at issues of migratory animals. These projects include MICO project, Migratory Connectivity of the Oceans Program, the IBA's project on um, important bird areas, and the EMMA's project looking at important marine mammal areas. And I just want to very briefly highlight these projects. So first, the important bird areas project is looking at synthesizing information on seabirds around the world to help inform international processes. And this is extremely important on trying to synthesize this information for use in management and also the description of ecologically or biologically significant areas. So these IBAs, important bird areas, have been used effectively in informing the CBD ecological or biologically significant EPSA process by providing information that can be brought into those global workshops that's already been synthesized to show these are important areas for seabirds. Similarly, we're looking at the development of important marine mammal areas as a way to also get the scientific community, the specialists in marine mammals, to describe areas that are of special importance for those species. Finally, the third project in this cluster of projects called MICO is one that's being conducted in our lab. And this project brings together many, many researchers from around the world to look at the connectivity of important air, ocean areas. And so this is not just looking at the places where we find the important animals, but also the connecting routes that connect them, the pathways and corridors that connect these species. So this MICO project tries to fill the knowledge gap of looking at where we're finding information on the oceans of important areas and the connections between them and trying to bring that information directly into the policy and management arena. Finally, one of the things looking into the future is the need to support emerging global programs to develop the knowledge to manage our oceans. And so one, not the only one, but one that we really want to highlight is the emerging United Nations Decade of Ocean Science. Um, this is something that we feel could be very important to try to broaden our knowledge base and our information and synthesis of information to directly provide new data to help support biodiversity management beyond national jurisdiction. So to recap, take home messages. We need open access biodiversity data, which will be essential for managing biodiversity beyond national jurisdiction. We need knowledge on marine life moving within and beyond national jurisdiction. We need an increased focus on data collection in areas beyond national jurisdiction, in midwater columns, and in the deep seas. We need to properly fund and strengthen the existing international infrastructure and institutions, not develop new institutions, but to strengthen the ones that already exist. And we need to look at the decade of ocean science for sustainable development as an opportunity to focus research efforts on necessary data collection, analysis, and synthesis. Thank you. Thank you, Professor. So we have one question. I hope you can hear me um, coming yep. in. Well, we have a few questions. 
the first one uh, is in regard to OBIS. And the question is, uh, does it have the IT and human resource capabilities to handle additional data that you predict would be generated? And also, does OBIS have the uh, capability to connect with other existing databases? Uh, and does it have capabilities to harvest data? Okay. It's an e excellent question. So, OBIS is a consortium where there's a central repository that's under the IODE offices of IOC, um, UNESCO IOC in Belgium, in Ostend, Belgium. Um, there are a number of geographic and thematic nodes. Um, our lab runs what's called OBIS CMAP, which is the node, international node for marine mammals, sea turtles, and seabirds, the migratory species. So we organize that data and then we give that data to the main international program in Belgium. Um, we, these areas are need more funding, they need more resources, but the infrastructure is there. The human infrastructure of um, different organized groups in different regions around the world and scientists does exist. But as we move forward, we need to, to get increased um, resources and more stable funding to keep this moving forward. So my main point is that the infrastructure is there. We just need to support it in a in a better way. Okay, excellent. Thank you. So we have a few more questions coming in. Um, this one is in regard to, uh, I believe you said something in regard to not creating a new institution. I'm not sure. Uh, if you could maybe explain or clarify uh, what this was in regard to or what you meant by this one. Yes, I mean, this was a personal opinion here on, I think there's been quite a bit of uh, repeated movement in the past when people get excited about a new opportunity to develop new data and they want to create a new system, a new network, a new website. And my point is that many of the existing the existing infrastructure is already in place. We just need to organize it and fund it and increase the capability um, and the usage. And so um, all too many times I see funders supporting the development of a new site without going on to um, supporting the existing locations. So I, I think we are, we're at a point right now where it could be very powerful to, to take the existing infrastructure globally on ocean observing networks, OBIS, other tools, and to be able to look at um, developing these warehouses of data and to, um, to sustain them and to increase access instead of inventing another process on top of that. So that's, that's my main point. Okay, one last question and then we go to the next uh, presentations. So this one is for you, um, how, how to link the various sources of data uh, together so that users know how to find them? Is there, is there ways to, to link the different data coming through different sources? So there are a variety of different data types. So OBIS brings together the biological observation data. Um, there's already world data centers that exist for oceanographic data. So there's many existing um, data centers and many of these could be linked together. Um, they, you know, the, it depends on the project activities. Most of the more modern programs that we're working with these days tend to use, are starting to use web services and other kinds of techniques to be able to link information um, through internet services um, instead of having people you know, have to download individual data files when they want to use them. So as we move into a more interconnected age, um, it's actually providing these internet services that are extremely important. So, um, so there is a lot of technical activity that can be done to help strengthen the usage and synthesis of this type of information. Okay, excellent. Thank you, Professor Halp. Uh, so that is going to end our Q&A session uh, for the first presentations. And we had a few more questions come in here in the 
during the, the Q&A. So we'll, we'll get back to those during the, the Q&A session after the next two, two presentations, if we have time, which we should. So we're now going to hand, over, hand it over to Johanna Prustman from WWF Columbia to make a, a presentation on marine biodiversity, focusing specifically on the Southeast Pacific. Give us a few seconds to hand over. Okay, hello to everybody. Uh, are you able to see my screen properly? Yes, we can see it. Thanks. Perfect. Go ahead. Okay, so as Ben was saying, uh, I'm going to speak a little bit about marine biodiversity beyond the national jurisdiction in the Southeast Pacific uh, region, uh, which is located uh, along the coast and um, along the western coast of uh, South America and Central America, ranging uh, from uh, Mexico until Chile. Uh, it's um, co co it covers around 40, 42 uh, million square kilometers. Um, the okay. Uh, sorry. <laughs> so um, it is composed by um, it is covered mostly by the South Pacific gyre, and the most important currents that cover the area are the Humboldt or Peru current that goes uh, uh, from south to north along the the eastern part of the Pacific Ocean. And it is very important ecologically and biologically because it, it brings cold waters filled with whole, uh, a lot of nutrients from the cold Ant uh, Antarctic waters to the equator. And also the South Equatorial Current that goes from, uh, from east to west along the equator. Uh, it, it is also a very um, significant current because uh, it also bring, um, transfers a lot on a, on a, of energy along this, this region and it has also climatic implications uh, regarding the El Niño phenomenon and other atmospheric phenomena, uh, coupling um, atmospheric and oceanic uh, phenomena. Um, okay, so if we see at the sea surface temperature, it is uh, there is a lot of corrugation, correlation with the productivity along the coast of Western South America. And as you can see, uh, the, the, in the austral winter, the cold waters from the Arctic Pacific go from the east, from the south to the north bringing a lot of productivity along this coast. Uh, but mostly during the, the Austral summer, this is very, the, the productivity is really, really high. And it, but this is not only because the Humboldt current, which is of course very important, but there's also another phenomenon that causes for this productivity in mostly in Peru and Chile, uh, to be to be very very important, uh, and it's called surges, and it's a mechanism where the cold waters, well, the the, the um, circulation of the of the earth moves the water uh, in a, in in a, in a way that um, warm water on the surface is replaced by cold water from the from the bottom of the ocean bringing also a lot of nutrients and important okay, yes and, and important uh, characteristics for the um, food chain in these are in these regions the, there is there are two main um, phenomena of, or, or ways that the this disurgence is, is happens. One is along the equatorial current, which I, which I just showed you, and um, it's along along this this region where where by by the rotation of of Earth, the waters kind of separate, and the waters on the surface. So warm uh, cold water from the from the bottom of the ocean comes and replaces this warm water that is flowing in the northern hemisphere to the north and in the southern hemisphere to the south and also along the coast of peru ecuador and the bit of colombia 
let's also um, a coastal upwelling currents uh, where the, the wind drives the circu this circulation and this water is being replaced by cold waters from the bottom. Uh, another very important phenomenon along this region is the, the ENSO, El Niño and South, uh, Southern Oscillation. Uh, and it's a uh, phenomenon that periodically fluctuates in between three phases. It has normal conditions, it has weakening con con conditions, which is uh, El Niño, and it has stronger conditions, which is La Niña. It is driven mostly by the trade winds that flow from the west to the east. And, uh, but when these winds are weakened, that's when we have uh, these, these warm waters that are usually kept uh, in the western part of the Pacific Ocean by these trade winds. It, since they are weakened, they come over to the equator, bringing wet, uh, wet conditions to a region that is mostly, it's very re uh, renowned for being very, very dry. This, uh, along this coast is the Atacama Desert, one of the driest regions in the, in the world. But when the, the trade winds are weakened, all this, this, um, this warm water from, the way, from Australia uh, brings very wet conditions along this coast. However, on the other side of the Andes, uh, mostly in, in Colombia, then we have very, very dry and hot periods. So it is very interesting how these, um, these processes affect not only the climatic conditions of the, of, of, of the, of the region, but also the runoff from rivers and that, that changes the bio, bio, geochemical cycle, cycles along this coast. Uh, so mostly the, the food change is weakened to the El Niño conditions because uh, the, 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 the fauna also uh, has to go deeper because as you can see here, the, the thermocline deepens. So mo, uh, the, the fauna has to go a, a lot deeper. Uh, and, and also the, the runoff makes for the salinity of the, the water in this region to be lower. Uh, but during La Niña conditions, uh, usually the effect is contrary and then the, the thermocline will be uh, more shallow and then we will have a lot of prim primarity productivity along the coast. Another uh, important climate phenomena is the Costa Rica Thermal Dome. It's another surgeon's area along the western coast of uh, Mexico, Guatemala, El Salvador, Honduras, Nicaragua, and Costa Rica. And uh, it brings a lot of nutrients and high concentrations of biodiversity. It's also an area very important for the connectivity between habitats in the high seas and the coastal areas. And it's critical for migratory species as sharks, cetaceans, rays, and sea turtles, among others. Uh, and also, many of these species are very important uh, in, a commercial, in, com in a commercial manner of, of speaking, less, uh, such as tuna, mahi-mahi, and squids. Uh, there are, this is an, an area that has a lot of uh, traffic, so there are uh, of, uh, of ships and commercial ships, and uh, so the environmental risks uh, are very high in this region for collision and, um, and oil spills, for example, for the biodiversity of this particular region. Uh, so there are uh, also very important geological features that are associated with an active tectonic framework of the region. We have the Cocos Ridge, the Carnegie Ridge, the Peru Chile Trench, the Galapagos Rise, Nazca Ridge, Sala y Gomez Ridge, Chile Rise, and the Guafa Fracture Zone. And these areas are very important because they, they are hotspots for biodiversity and also for uh, thermal vents in the deep seas. Uh, uh, this study, Ho and Al, uh, um, discovered, well, not discovered, that they gather information on, this, in, on these parts uh, that, uh, that hold this hydrothermal vent, there have been nine identified hydrothermal vents along the Eastern Pacific Rise, the Galapagos Rift, and the Pacific Antarctic, Antarctic Bridge. I'm sorry for my, for my English, I apologize. Um, 
and also it is a region very with very important uh, mineral deposits, mostly polymetallic nodules, polymetallic or seafloor massive sulfites, and cobalt-rich ferromanganese crust. Uh, however, it is in, it is very important that the exploration of these mineral resources it cannot be considered in isolations of the distinctive and in some cases very unique assemblages of marine species that are associated with these habitats and these structures. Um, so this, uh, the, this region uh, the southeastern Pacific region is very important in, um, for, for apex predators. However, we do find that there are a lot of GATA gaps and information gaps in this region con uh, comparing to the, the northern, uh, the northeastern Pacific region because the, the sampling effort has been great in, in these regions. But with the information we have so far, we can see that it is a very important migration route for leatherback turtles and humpback whales, among other species. Uh, we have also information on leatherback sea turtles, seeing that they can uh, perform migrations greater than uh, 4,000 kilometers. And, and in a commercially uh, aspect, we can see that in the in the region, the most um, fished species are the skipjack tuna uh, in the yellowfin tuna. We, we can see that the speedjack tuna, it's more important, the, it, or, or the, the biomass is greater in the, uh, south, in the south hemisphere, uh, whereas in the, northern hemisphere, in the northern hemisphere part of the region, the yellowfin tuna is uh, greater. And as what Patrick was telling us before, uh, there are currently um, the, the, these areas being determined called EPSAs, which are important areas for biodiversity and ecological conservation. So uh, in, the, in our area, there are a total of 25 identi identified EPSAs. Uh, in the, well, in the classification of the, of, of the CBD, uh, covering the eastern tropical and the temperate Pacific regions. However, only six areas uh, extend over the national jurisdictions into A, B, and J. And only three are solely located within the uh, A, B, and J. Um, so the, uh, th this, is, this slide shows these areas in, in blue that you can see here are areas that have a lower, um, a lower incidence of human stress factors. And as we can see, uh, th this also shows which are these areas that are within the e economic exclusive zones and uh, within marine protected areas. And only about 20% uh, of the percentage of the realm uh, within these wilderness areas is protected by marine uh, protected areas. However, there are some initiatives uh, for the conservation uh, in ABNJ areas. And we have, for example, the Eastern Tropic Tropical Pacific Seascape, which is a corridor between the Galapagos Marine Reserve, the Cocos National Park, uh, Coiba National Park in Panama, and Malpelo and Gorgona National Parks in, in Colombia. Uh, there, there are some other uh, protected areas but, uh, that are located in coastal regions, such as the Machalilla National Park, Las Baulas, Ostonal, Camarones, and Caletas. Uh, also, in the region, Chile has been developing a lot of marine protected areas in the last few years. And uh, we have here the, the, an, an area that has, is being de declared in the Eastern Island protected area. And this is also very important because it is, it is a region that is in the migratory path of many, many species as well and is very important for commercial fishing, although it is still largely unexplored. And also the Inter-American Tropical Tuna Commission and the International Dolphin Conservations have been performing uh, many, ex 
well, many experiments uh, with fish aggregating devices in that for, uh, so the dolphin and other important species and endangered species, species bycatch are lowered using these uh, these devices that allow to to aggregate uh, different kinds of species and trying to develop techniques that avoid the the bycatch of this uh, of this other important species so uh, to summarize uh, on an ecological level the southeastern pacific region is characterized by high primary net productivity which is combined with a very active framework which produces multiple geological forms such as rises, ridges and trenches and this combination yields on one of the world's biggest fisheries. However, most of these rely on basically a single species which is the Peruvian anchoveta. It is also an important pathway for migratory species such as marine mammals, fish and tortoises among others. Uh, the ocean atmosphere coupling phenomena such as El the Enzo and the thermic dome of Costa Rica greatly change the climatic con conditions, the direction and the productivity, uh, and thus the food networks along the region. Uh, so no, nevertheless, there are still huge voids in scientific information, resulting in a problem and underestimation of the region's ecological importance and the provision on the ecosystem services that they provide, as well as the stressors and the anthropic change drivers. Uh, but some conserva conservation efforts have been carried out so far by many countries, but there's a need of an incidence on the assessment and control of these pressure factors to develop better governance schemes in order to protect the integrity or, of this region's biodiversity. So if you have any questions, we can answer afterwards in the, during the, the Q&A session. And also you can email us uh, with any questions or information that you may need. Thank you very much. Thank you, Johanna, for a great presentation. Um, we had a few questions come in, so excellent. We will uh, come back to the questions now after the next uh, presentation, but please feel free to um, please feel free to write more questions into the box on the side and we will we will get to them. Uh, in the next uh, Q&A session. Now we're going to hear uh, a presentation from Ross Wanless from BirdLife International Africa, uh, focusing on the Southeast Atlantic. So please, Ross. Can everybody hear me? Yes, now loud and clear, Ross, please go ahead. Okay, great. Hi, everybody. Uh, thanks for that. And um, I'm going to be taking a slightly different tack from Joanna in that I will be presenting a slightly broader overview of marine biodiversity, some of the threats and pressures, um, looking at some of the connectivity things that Patrick touched on as well. Um, and making a case for the, the need for biodiversity conservation and spatial conservation in the high seas. Uh, this talk was prepared uh, with support from Maria Diaz, my colleague from Cambridge. Okay, so <clears throat> the number one impact that human beings have on the ocean by a very long yard, um, and not just the ocean on its ecosystems and the biodiversity in the oceans, is of course fishing. The Food and Agriculture Organization, or FAO's annual state of the world's fisheries report uh, from 2016, uh, I've taken a, a screen grab from that. Um, and you can see the, the key point of interest on this graph is the light blue uh, section at the top. Um, and you can see there's a downward trend um, from around 90% of stocks were fully fished um, or underfished, which is the state that according to FAO, you want to be and you want to have your stocks fully fished. That means we're maximizing the production of protein from the ocean. 
And that's declined to about 75% in, in more recent years. So um, sadly, we are now able to extract considerably less information, um, protein from the, from the oceans than we, we were previously. The interconnectedness of marine food webs makes it very clear that uh, we can't simply remove vast quantities of a certain species and be certain that the ecosystem will continue to bounce back or function the way it used to. And, and what you see on your picture uh, on the screen here is a scribble diagram um, listing 50 or so species and the various uh, relationships between them. And, and as you can imagine, you, you pull out one species from that system or vastly reduce the, uh, the numbers of individuals in that species from that system, and it's going to have some fairly profound effects. I'm going to drill down a little bit now into uh, the upwelling systems, and Joanna touched on these uh, previously, but just to give a little bit more um, detail, uh, these are classic wasp weight wasp waste systems. Uh, in other words, um, there's a huge biomass and diversity um, of predators at the top of the food chain. Uh, and there's a huge diversity of plankton and, um, and, and smaller organisms, but those tend to be funneled through a very few species in the middle. Those are typically the anchovies or sardines. Um, and those are heavily fished. Those are called forage fish because everything eats them or everything eats the things that eat them. Um, and tackling forage fisheries is, uh, is the new frontier in terms of sustainable ocean management. We really have some, some gigantic challenges ahead of us if we start taking out the krill in the Antarctica or the anchoveta in the Pacific or the sardines in, in the Benguela. And in fact, I'm going to, uh, I'm going to show that to you now, um, an example of uh, Namibian pelagic fish catchers. And you can see uh, in the 1960s and early 1970s, the red is the sardine, rampant overfishing of, uh, of the sardine stocks. In, in peak, they were taking almost 1.5 million tons of sardine a year. Uh, huge collapses, a bit of a switch to anchovy, further collapses, and so it went on up until 2001, when the last... Nothing. And not a single sardine has been caught in Namibia since then. And look what happens when I overlay the uh, population numbers of African penguins, which are specialists on anchovy and sardine. The scale is on the right-hand side. It's a completely different scale. So we're not talking about 1.5 million tons of, of penguins. Um, so don't get confused by that, but it's just, it's an illustrative thing. And I hope you can see that that downward trend, that crash matches very, very closely with the rampant overfishing and collapse of the stocks. Um, and so we seem to be heading to um, a changed ecosystem, the point I was making earlier. Namibia's ecosystem is now dominated by jellyfish or gelatinous species. And these things consume small fish, which makes it really, really unlikely that the Namibian ecosystem will ever be able to recover to its former fish dominated state. And so indeed, perhaps we will be enjoying jellyfish burgers from Namibia before too long. This, um, the impact of fishing is, is obviously pervasive and, and it's the number one challenge that we face to conserve ocean biodiversity. Um, and it's all good and well setting rules, but Illegal, unregulated, and unreported fishing is a gigantic challenge. And this is a heat map from uh, the Global Fish Watch um, showing, um, their, uh, sh showing the, I, um, the European Union's global fishing footprint. It's heavily focused on, on um, areas away from, uh, from Europe itself. So you can see that there are fleets 
uh, which which move vast distances. Now the I, the, the European Union fleets tend to be very rule abiding fleets, not exclusively. There are some challenges there. But I'm using this to illustrate just how widespread fishing effort from certain nations is. And if you can consider the scale of the ocean, how difficult is it to know which vessel is fishing exactly where and when? And how do we manage that? And illegal fishing or IUU fishing is stealing billions of dollars from countries. And it makes it impossible for managers on high seas or in countries to, to manage fishing impacts because it's not reported. We don't know where the fishing effort took place, how many fish or what species were caught, what gears they were using even. And so you can't manage impact, you can't manage sustainability if you have widespread IU fishing. This is going to be one of the challenges that humanity is going to have to grapple with in the, in the very near future. A talk on fishing wouldn't be complete without mentioning the non-target impacts or bycatch, incidental capture. Um, and this is a huge focus for BirdLife International, um, solving problems for, of seabird bycatch. But the incidental capture of other species uh, continues um, and, and is hugely problematic around the world. These are the species which are typically discarded as dead. They have no commercial value. Um, and yet, they can cause the collapse of species, of, of the bycatch species, without causing the collapse of the target species. So we have, a, we have a bit of a problem there that we really need to solve. And many people are working really hard to find ways to catch fish sustainably without causing non-target impacts. Now, why would you care about this? Why do you care about uh, what's happening in the high seas? And, and, and Patrick, certainly alluded to that, and so did Joanna. And here's another um, lovely image of a tuna tagging program. And you can see that the concentration of where the fish were caught um, is, is right in the center. But some of those tuna that were tagged in this program moved massive distances. And the connectivity from, your, from a country's exclusive economic zone into the high seas is everywhere in the oceans. Oceans operate fundamentally differently from how uh, landscapes and terrestrial environments operate. And that connectivity is difficult for us as humans, which are very terrestrial species, to get our heads around. Here's another example of some really impressive connectivity. Moving on to seabirds, we can see that you've got a, a species of shearwater breeding on an island, but all of its, um, and this is off the coast of Africa, all of the foraging is being done along the shoreline of Africa. And so these birds are moving from uh, one country through the high seas into another country. And if they're caught in that second country, whose responsibility is it? Another question to ask is, whose bird is it? If it's caught in your waters, is it your bird and your problem? But if it breeds in another country, is it their bird and their problem? Seabirds are, of course, highly visible, and they're cheaper and easier to study than many other marine species. And seabirds demonstrate how massively interconnected the Atlantic Ocean really is. And you can see from just these four examples um, of how widely uh, animals, the, these seabirds move across the Atlantic Ocean, and the diversity of migratory patterns that they show. Some hug the, uh, the Eastern Atlantic seaboard, Others crisscross the Atlantic Ocean. Some move just minor distances. There's a huge range of strategies and processes at play here. And, and so we've really got to think big if we're going to tackle marine conservation for highly migratory species. Um, and it's not just the Atlantic Ocean that has all of this migratory connectivity. And this is a, a screen grab from BirdLife International's seabird tracking database. Um, and it's clear from this image that there is no part of the ocean that isn't used by seabirds at some point. Um, and so we need to use these data to understand where the hotspots, and Patrick again alluded to marine important bird areas um, and how those have been fed into EBSAs. And we really need to strengthen those processes and really get turtles and sharks and cetaceans and 
uh, fish and other things into these sorts of analyses with this sort of tracking data so that we can truly understand where we're at. Resources in the, uh, in the areas beyond national jurisdiction extend, of course, far beyond just seabirds and just uh, fish. Um, um, besides fishing, there are marine genetic resources and new drugs and new cures for cancer and so forth are probably going to be found from marine organisms as much as anywhere else because the marine biodiversity is so high. And of course, and Joanna alluded to this, lots of mineral resources and human beings are starting to access those resources. We're not sure what the consequences of deep sea mining are. We're not sure what the consequences are if you suck out all of the uh, nutrients such as phosphates from a, a seabed, what does that do for the productivity in that ocean, in, in that area of the ocean? These are big unknowns and we've got to be really careful and conservative about how we go in and deal with the ocean. So my, uh, my closing point is um, really around productivity. So we know that, um, uh, and, and conservation. We know the ocean is full of cool biodiversity, highly interconnected systems, vectored, that, that interconnectivity is vectored by birds, whales, fish, but it's also vectored by ocean currents, shipping, um, and the so-called distant water fishing fleets. So how are we doing in protecting our oceans? What is, where are we at? Um, and noting that there are processes that Patrick mentioned but those are still very much up in the air, no decisions around them. That's what the, the project that we're part of here, the Strong High Seas Project, is geared to try and understand. What I did here is went onto Google Earth and I clicked on a couple of layers. Particularly, I want to draw your attention to the census of marine life and the layer of marine protected areas. Um, and as you can see from the map, it looks startlingly like there's nothing there. In fact, those layers are there, they are present, but we have so little information about what's out there and we have done so little to protect the ocean environment that it's clear we've got a long way to go and the BB&J negotiations um, hopefully will help us deliver some meaningful gains so that we can protect this incredible biodiversity upon which so much of our society rests. So thank you very much, and I'm happy to take questions. Uh, and there's my email address for those who wish to send me an email. Okay, thanks, Ross. That was a, a great presentation, that was super interesting. Uh, we're now uh, pretty much come to the end of the hour as planned, but we had a few questions come in, so we're going to go another five minutes uh, and try to answer. Uh, at least a few of them for, for those who want to stick around. Um, uh, and then we'll, we'll, we'll end it there. And I guess any questions that come in, uh, we can try to deal with them over email. So I, I wanted to jump to Johanna first. Uh, we had a few questions on the Southeast Pacific. So I'm going to unmute your microphone uh, and uh, ask you a question. here. So the question for you is, uh, we have a participant that would like to know if with climate change it is already possible to see a, a trend indicating a constant increase uh, level of temperature in the South Pacific waters as well as change in biodiversity distribution uh, and occurrence of alien species. So I, I hope you heard that. Yeah. yeah, so with climate change what we are seeing is not only a warming of the of the wires, but rather uh, uh, a trend to go to more to, um, that the frequency of extreme temperatures, either high and low, is greater. So the impact on biodiversity is that it is harder for them to adapt to the high frequency of this extreme temperature and, and also changes in salinity because uh, what what is the climate change is driving also the very extreme precipitations along the coast so the runoff is greater and the salinity changes are greater so with uh, so the, one of the threats to the to, to the biodiversity of this region is trying to adapt to the, the, the extreme 
velocity and frequency that these changes are taking place. So that is the, the main impact of climate change on the on the biodiversity besides all the other uh, uh, anthropic stress factors. Okay, thanks, Johanna. Um, now I'm going to ask a question to Professor Daniel Dunn and Professor Halpin from Duke. Um, so I'm going to unmute both of your microphones. I'm not sure. Uh, okay, I can't seem to unmute Daniel, so I'm going to... This one's for you then, uh, Professor Halpin. Uh, this is okay. regard to the um, OBUS. Uh, and we're having we have a question as to whether OBUS could become part of the the BBNJ agreement in the future, uh, and do you think that this could possibly operate separately from potential clearinghouse mechanisms, or if OBUS could house uh, all of the information associated which with uh, a future BBNJ agreement in regard to environmental impact assessments or, or the like? And I think Daniel is now unmuted too, so I'm not sure who wants to answer that question. I could start out and then see if Daniel has other comments as well. Um, so my comments previously was that when we're thinking about new clearinghouses is to build on the existing infrastructure and OBIS is one of the pieces in that puzzle. So I feel that OBIS could play a very large role um, in providing um, biodiversity data globally. Um, for areas beyond national jurisdiction. So I see that could be a, a very powerful role for OBIS. Um, it wouldn't be exclusive. I think that there's many other types of data and information that need to be put together. Um, my point was that there already are existing international institutions such as OBIS, Goose, Imbon, and the list goes on, that these would be the building blocks that could be organized together to form what we might be considering the new clearinghouse. Um, Daniel, do you have comments as well? Um, yeah, I think that's that's uh, sort of the general direction that, that we've been heading with the, the thinking. I think one of the, the main questions right now isn't whether OBIS is going to be a critical element. I think it's, it's widely agreed and has been brought up many times at in the prep comms that OBIS and the um, IOC in general are, are critical elements of, of any new agreement and uh, will support um, a clearinghouse mechanism. I think the question is, is, the broader question that still needs to be resolved is what does that clearinghouse mechanism look like? Uh, how does it utilize the, the resources and support the resources that currently exist? Uh, and, and who are the main users of the, the clearinghouse mechanism? And I think if we can get a little bit more clarity on that, it'll be um, a lot easier to uh, answer questions about um, uh, OBIS's role uh, within it um, and and how it would be, would be used by uh, policymakers and, and managers. But um, I, don't, I think everybody is in agreement and there's been very little pushback at, at the prep comms with respect to the role of OBIS as uh, the major uh, data warehouse for observations of marine species in BBNJ. Okay, thanks to both of you. Um, great answers. I think we have time for maybe one more question. This one is uh, for you, Ross, at BirdLife, uh, and then we'll have to close uh, the webinar for today. So the question uh, is, is, what is the BirdLife international strategy to strengthen the current existing regional fisheries management organizations uh, to address fishing issues in the high sea? So I hope you understood there, Ma, Ross? Yeah, so it, it, specifically around IUU, is that is that correct? That is the question? Uh, it's it, it's not, no, it's, it's asked in general, but if you have ideas okay. in regard to IUU, I think that's great. Sure, okay, so yeah, in, in general, we're, we're working incredibly hard and have been for, uh, since 2004, on, on engaging with RFMOs. Um, the BirdLife strategy is not to throw bombs, um, but is to get our 
um, hands dirty, knuckle down and do the work and work collaboratively with organizations. So we try to strengthen organizations. We try to understand where the challenges are and, and work to overcome those. And that approach has been really successful for our core interest, which is seabirds, getting seabird conservation measures approved. And we are, we are moving more and more towards um, ad adapting that model into compliance and, and how to work with countries and with RFMOs to improve compliance, um, how to strengthen data collection systems, transparency, all of those things. And so um, our strategies involve um, exploring new technologies like Global Fish Watch and bringing those into um, into the RFMO um, understanding. We're, um, we're working hand in glove with key fishing fleets uh, that um, that have seabird bycatch um, concerns and, and trying to assist them in transitioning to become compliant, developing new systems um, and supporting other organizations, working collaboratively with organizations like Pew, Oceana, WWF and so forth to, um, to strengthen um, compliance systems and observer programs in particular. So uh, that's a fairly generic answer. I'm hoping it's sufficient. No, great. Thanks, Ross. I think that covers it. Um, so I think that brings us to the end of our webinar for today. Uh, I want to thank all of the presenters for, for taking the time to come and give these interesting presentations and uh, take a few minutes to answer questions afterwards. Uh, I hope all participants uh, enjoyed the webinar. Thank you also for, for attending. Um, if you uh, if you're interested in learning more about the project or have questions, please feel free to contact us at Strong High Seas uh, at iss-potsdam.de and we'll try to answer uh, any emails or questions coming in as, as soon as we can. Uh, and also, uh, we will have the PowerPoint slides to share uh, with participants. And then I also please encourage you to fill out uh, the survey you will receive after the webinar. It's very short and would be very helpful for us. So with that, uh, I wish you a uh, very nice rest of your days and thanks again.